University, who is going to talk about uh, dormancy, slow growth, no growth, etc. So thanks a lot, uh, Jay, for being with us. Okay. Someone let me know if my voice is projecting through there. Or, okay. Uh, so, so hello, welcome. Uh, thanks for thanks for having me here. Um, uh, it's my first time in this part of Italy before. I'm, I'm on sabbatical right now, so it's given me an opportunity to explore some new places in Europe and, and, and meet some new people. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, I actually have two lectures, one today and one tomorrow, that are sort of related. And so what I thought I would do today is kind of just lay the groundwork or fundamentals for for what I think uh, about this concept of dormancy and its role in the, the, the complexity and diversity of microbial systems. Um, before I do that, um, maybe I'll just give a little bit of context uh, and, and try to describe the types of questions that our group is interested in. Um, so uh, we're interested in what generates and maintains uh, biodiversity at different spatial and temporal scales. And we focus almost exclusively on, on microbial forms of life, uh, bacteria, uh, viruses, um, sometimes uh, fungi and yeast. Um, and we're interested, I guess, from there, trying to understand to what degree microbial life forms follow laws and behaviors and patterns that have been documented for centuries in plant and animal systems. So are there general rules that we can apply to all domains of life. Um, and that's a type of question that, uh, due to methodological limitations, has been inaccessible, uh, by and large, just because of the way in which we study microbes up until probably 15 years ago, the advent of high-throughput sequencing, which allowed us, in terms of diversity, to, to sample at appropriate depths to characterize the diversity of very abundant microbial uh, assemblages. Um, so, I guess it was, uh, you know, maybe five, six years ago, a colleague, a postdoc of mine, we started to try to tackle this question by compiling as much biodiversity data that we could get our hands on. So, there are lots of publicly available data sets for forest inventories, um, plant data sets, insect data sets, um, you know, wh where, where communities have been very well characterized in terms of the species and abundances that exist in those sites. Um, and then we were able to start to pull together uh, Amplicon data sets, 16S ribosomal RNA data sets, through uh, global efforts where people were trying to survey with very similar methods uh, the diversity of microbial communities. Of course, there's different ways in which you're characterizing those communities. If you're an avian biologist or ornithologist, you're often listening or maybe looking through a pair of binoculars to characterize what organisms are in some hectare environment that you're, you can detect either through your eyes or your ears, whereas molecular techniques where you know, extracting DNA and amplifying a single gene within a genome. And so there's pros and cons with all of these things, but when all is said and done, we were able to amass uh, really large data sets um, and to move forward with this question of whether or not microbes and macrobes exhibit similar patterns of biodiversity, we thought it important to consider one uh, big difference, which is the, the abundance of individuals in a sample. So if you went out into a prairie or an old field and you wanted to survey plant communities, uh, you might put down a, a one meter by one meter plot and you count all the individuals in that site. Um, maybe there'd be dozens of individuals or maybe a hundred. Um, but in a gram of soil from that same plot, you'd probably have upwards uh, of a billion individuals. And so we know from kind of statistical sampling that the probability of encountering new things goes up as you sample more things. And so we constructed these things called uh, you know, abund uh, diversity abundance uh, scaling laws uh, for the data sets. And we found from this that uh, microbes and macrobes did have similar scaling relationships across many orders of magnitude. So when we combined that with other uh, types of biodiversity theory, we were able then to make predictions for how many uh, microbial taxa there may be on a planetary scale. And that number happens to be uh, about 10 to the 12, or 1 trillion. Um, so for those of you who are, are familiar with the census of life on Earth, uh, if we think about plants and animals, there's somewhere on an order of 1 to 10 million estimated species. And we're pretty confident with that number. So this means that when we include microbes, uh, we're expanding the, the, the number of species that we share the, the planet with by, by six orders of magnitude, which is a big number. Um, so we've been testing that with different types of data sets. We get the same answer. We've been thinking about the underlying assumptions about the species abundance distribution, which is really important for some of our projections. 
And we've also recently been thinking about whether or not there's simply been enough time on Earth to arrive at such a number. Uh, thinking about things like the speciation rate, um, hard to measure, but we have some numbers, and extinction. How, how often do, do, do microorganisms like archaea and bacteria go extinct? How are they affected by mass extinction events that occurred in, in Earth's history? And if we took those things into consideration, could we even arrive at a number of 10 to the power of 12? Uh, our estimates suggest that it, that it is, and it kind of asks, begs us questions moving forward about like, what the upper limits of, uh, of diversity in life are on, on our planet. So those are some pretty cosmic questions, but those are the things that kind of uh, ground and motivate our work is trying to understand that complexity and diversity of the microbial world. Uh, so when, when we start to ask these questions about um, the maintenance of biodiversity, the generation and maintenance of biodiversity, we start to ask about ecological questions about how that diversity is maintained. Why are there so many species coexisting in a gram of soil, in a liter of seawater, or whatever in our guts? Why aren't there fewer number of species? So, the, the, so, so there's a lot of complexity. And, and uh, there are multiple explanations and theories for how it is that we can pack species in like this. Um, but many of those theories tend to focus on the differences among species. Uh, and we can characterize those differences as being traits, uh, which can be defined as the physiological, uh, morphological, or behavioral characteristics of an individual uh, that influences its performance or fitness in a given set of environmental conditions, okay? I was told by Jacopo that there would be interruptions. I'm, 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 should I be concerned at this point that, uh, that there have uh, been none? <laughs> okay, well, you know, I ha so I have like 25 slides, which I know in certain audiences is a lot, in other audiences is not so much, and so I'm, if we don't get through it, that's okay too. Um, yeah, maybe you're going to get there. It sounds like a, a lot of the backdrop of what you're doing is classical ecology and, and speciation theory, maybe. Um, will, you, will you show a definition of microbial species that sort of deals with horizontal uh, gene transfer? And yeah, so I mean, those are really important. Uh, maybe not even philosophical issues, but what is a microbial uh, species or taxon? We're using an operational definition because the data that was available to us was collected in that consistent manner. But it's important to recognize that, that that's a very conservative uh, estimate uh, of what a, what a, a species is. Um, so, so I think for this conversation, I'm going to move on into thinking about questions uh, of traits. And one of those traits will be dormancy. So I'm kind of just segueing in from a broad perspective. But yeah, we could have a long discussion about what uh, a microbial species is, how we define that in, in terms of rates of recombination and, and, and such. But, um, yeah, I conveniently try to like to just work around that. So I mean, I would be uh, highly interested just to, to like hear your overview of this. So, yeah, I mean, I think for you know, the, the same issue is true for. Here's a non-satisfying argument. Uh, we know there are a lot of cryptic species in non-microbial taxa. Things that we call a species will actually have probably multiple lineages within them. Perhaps ones that don't satisfy either phylogenetic or biological definitions of a species concept. And so for these types of large-scale data sets that I showed you in those patterns, we're sort of coarse graining them at some level. And you know, they, they may not satisfy every single definition of what a species is. But what I would say is that for the definition that we used, which was uh, you know, looking at similarity at a marker gene, the 16S ribosomal RNA, there's all kinds of reasons why you wouldn't expect there to be similar scaling relationships. Remember the, the binoculars or measuring trees in a forest. Like, we, we, we identify species in so many different ways and so many diff different approaches. And yet, when we think about these patterns that emerge over orders of magnitude, we see that there are similar um, scaling relationships. And we actually statistically went in and tried to say, well, what if we defined a species of a microbe in a slightly different way, a more or less conservative fashion? And, and those, those findings are robust to those types of um, uh, recalculations. So they're not sensitive to what appears to be a lot of different ways in which we would classify what a species might be. You ask for questions. <laughs> yeah, you want the questions. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I should have uh, just kept going. <laughs> <laughs> Can you maybe uh, just talk a little bit more about what a trait is for you, sort of going from like functional traits, binary traits? Yeah. Um, because. Yeah, traits sometimes are stuff you measure externally, and sometimes it's sort of more on a gene scale level that you look at it. 
what's your, what's your approach here? Yeah, so I mean, I think if you talk to other non-microbial biologists, they would say a trait is a phenotype, something that, um, and so um, how often do we as cell biologists or microbiologists actually measure uh, phenotypes, whether it be uh, metabolic or, or morphological? I would say that, that we're not really, that, that, that framework doesn't uh, lend itself nicely to the way we study microbes, right? Uh, in part because we can't look at most microbes, we can't cultivate most microbes. We can infer things about their uh, metabolic potential from looking at genomes, and that's, I think, something that people have done, and I think maybe that's okay. But um, <coughs> if you applied that same definition to plants, they say, oh, well, a plant has this gene. I don't think a lot of plant biologists would say that that's a trait. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if that's where you're going, but, but, but I think like we've had to, this framework is, is potentially useful. I think there are contexts where we, we wanna know how organisms perform, microorganisms perform, and we have to come up with creative ways to figure out how they do that. I think traits probably exist, but they're, you know, when, when you measure plants, like you can go and we can measure, and it, we can look at an individual, we can measure its photosynthetic capacity, we can measure its rates of respiration, uh, all, all sorts of things because they're they're studyable. They're they're independent. We can we can look at them and work with them in a non-destructive way. We can measure their fitness components, things like the, the number of flowers or or seeds that are produced at the end of a growing season. Those are really hard things to measure at an individual level in a microbial system. Of course, I think there's people here like you know, I was just hanging out in in Zurich and seeing you know, people. Who I know there's people here who work in these labs, you know, a lot of microfluidic devices where we can measure things like demographics uh, in population, but arguably in, in on a petri dish or in a device chamber, right? So um, there is some kind of disconnect between if we want to study things in nature under conditions. I, I think that's what we want. Is many micro, many bi biologists want to be able to study things that are that matter in in, in an environment of some sort. So yeah, I think there are challenges, but um, I don't know if that answered your question. I would say physiology, morphology, maybe behavior. Those are, if we can measure those things. Um, yeah, and no, it, it sort of, I think, answers most of it. Um, but, but there's like in the trait-based community, there's also this, these thought of like master traits. Okay. Um, you know, like they always like to use size, and yeah. I haven't quite understood size in microbes yet. It seems a little bit <laughs> one-dimensional. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but what sort of the traits maybe you're really interested in? Like, are those like specific ones? Like, I mean, if you say dormancy, that seems like a one zero yeah. thing, right? Sort of either you have it or you don't, or is it a spectrum maybe also? A spectrum in terms of the metabolic status of an individual or whether or not an, an organism has the capacity to do it or not. Yeah, capacity, but say another trait like swimming speed. It's yeah. a very, that's it's a continuous, yeah, it's yeah. continuous trait. That's um, not a, I have it or not. Yeah, sort of whether problem. or not a cyanobacterium has the capacity to fix nitrogen or not. Of course, then you could say, if you do have the capacity to fix nitrogen, at what rate do you do that? And it probably varies among individuals. Yeah, I think the trait-based uh, uh, framework, as far as I, I view it, is something that accommodates both uh, continuous and categorical characters. Thanks for opening it for questions. Yeah. yeah, now we're having fun. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask a, a little bit more about the uh, abundance taxon richness plot yeah. that, that you showed. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. And um, there's lots of ways that you might think about disentangling why that is. But I just wanted to ask, um, or just give an example of a place that, an outlier. So I was at a hot spring in Japan recently, and it's a sulfitic hot spring. It's really hot, 80 degrees, and it's, it's full of biomass. So I didn't do any cell counts, but you can see these streamers in there. It's dense. It's yeah. super dense. Yeah. And uh, so I think the abundance of cells is really high. But when we've done molecular analyses, the diversity is really low. Yeah. So this is really different from a soil. And I'm just thinking, you know, I'm really jet lagged and just running on a few espressos right yeah. now. Yeah. But I'm just thinking about the, the fluid flow regime of, the, of that situation in comparison to a soil. Yeah. 
and the nutrient and energy availability and how how the cycling material and energy cycling yeah. in a soil is just so fundamentally different yeah. compared to this hot spring which is kind of like a chemostat it's yeah. sulfide and oxygen in and sulfate out and it, and it's kind of chemostat it's really really steady and I, I so i just wanted to kind of throw that out there and hear your idea yeah. about these these funny outliers because i love the trait that you're able to capture with that plot and you're obviously yeah. able to capture something and that's cool but i'm but then I start to think yeah. about other things that I've seen and how can we understand that. Sure. Um, so um, as I was putting some of these slides together, that this basically is a compilation of some other studies that have, we've done over the years. One of the things that I decided to add in the, uh, at the last minute was this idea, as it relates to dormancy, this concept of, of residence time. Um, and so I, I, I'll, I'll show a slide where I, I, you know, I have images of chemo We've been thinking about chemostats and how uh, flow rates and physical forces put constraints on both um, uh, on whether or not an organism can persist in an environment. And I think that the example that you're using is, um, is a good one, the contrasting soils versus uh, a, a hydrothermal vent. Yeah. So uh, maybe I'll show you um, some images, some pictures, and a few slides that will. Yeah, yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so I think I'll, I'll move on to the, the dormancy stuff. So trace guides some of the ways and can explain the coexistence and diversity. There's other theories, but trait-based approaches are, are, are one of the groups of ideas to explain patterns of diversity. Um, and, and one trait that our group has been thinking about a lot for about 10 years now is dormancy. And um, we take a really broad definition uh, that may not satisfy everyone, and we're careful about it. Um, so it's the ability of an individual to enter a reversible state of reduced metabolic activity. Um, and so we can think about that for a second. You can maybe even write it on the board. But so the, an individual, so an individual process, can change. It can go between different metabolic states. It has to be reversible. Um, and so when we define it that way, there are organisms like uh, viruses that can engage in. We can argue whether or not those are forms of life, but they can engage in things like latency. Herpes viruses do this. Uh, there are bacteria and fungi that can form spores. Hopefully, I'll, I'll show a little bit on some of the work that we've done on sporulation. Um, there, in the Mediterranean, there are a lot of uh, microbial single cell unicellular protists that can form cysts. Uh, rotifers can engage in cryptobiosis. Um, worms can form dower stages, uh, insects, diapause, amphibians can estivate, um, fish can go quiescent, birds can go into a torpor, um, there are marsupials that can delay blastocyst formation, and of course there are lots of mammals that can hibernate. Um, so there are a lot of examples there, and what I'll say is that in all of those instances there are no known genes, pathways, developmental programs that are conserved. Um, so it means that dormancy has evolved throughout the tree of life independently numerous times. And so when that happens, uh, this is an example uh, of convergent evolution. And usually when there's a convergent evolution, it's sort of interesting to biology because it means that independently, you know, you know, life is trying out different things and has arrived at a common solution to some major challenge. And with, in the case of dormancy, what that challenge is, is living in unpredictable, noisy, and fluctuating environments. So that, that's where I'll, as a premise that I'll leave you with. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just having this conversation. So the answer, I guess, if you look into it, people say no. But I was just thinking about this recently. It's like, well, why isn't it? Uh, I don't know. Like it, see, it fits that definition, but I, I think I would need to talk to us. There's a probably a, there's probably many journals on like sleep biology or something, and I'm sure there's some experts who would argue with me that this is not. But uh, yeah, so we 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 go into these periodic cycles of metabolic uh, suspension of activity. I don't know. Uh, what I'd want to know is what is what is special about sleep that distinguishes it from dormant. I guess that would be my response to the question. And I don't know the answer to that, but I've thought about it just recently. 
Sorry? The time scale? OK. With respect to the, maybe the, our lifespan? So we're gonna we're gonna yeah. So maybe if that's true, then we would need to define some kind of uh, some time scale at which metabolism reduces and resumes with respect to some other important. Uh, if you want to differentiate uh, sleep for dormancy, yes. Okay. That, that's your, that if you don't want, then you don't need yeah. it. But if you want to make a difference, that the time scale. I've just been avoiding it. <laughs> because it's not it's terribly relevant. I mean, it's, it's interesting philosophically, but I don't, I don't have like, I mean, so then making some kind of arbitrary cutoff just doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. But um, yeah, maybe there's something, yeah. Isn't there a notion of um, environment as well? Like, I mean, sleep is not a way to cope with sort of a, um, um, an environment that is unfavorable, right? Something that we do even in favorable environments on the contrary of like hibernation where the food will get low and so mm -hmm. the organism are just putting themselves in dormancy to sort of like yeah. cope with this uh, lack of resources. Yeah. And it feels like an important yeah. distinction for me. Yeah. I'm talking about, um, I mean, as someone who knows nothing scientific and scientifically both on like dormancy and sleep, but I would guess that, I mean, metabolic activity should be different in sleep versus like hibernation in mammals, for example, because I mean, mammals can go on for months without eating in dormancy. And yeah. I don't think even if you can force them to sleep for months, they would be able to go like for like months just sleeping. I, yeah. I don't know. I'm yeah, just, yeah. I, I mean, I, I would guess that if we could measure and look into the actual metabolic activity in sleep versus like hibernation in some mammals, there would be a difference. I don't know. I mean, there are things like circadian rhythms that are involved. I mean, yeah. yeah. So, so maybe it, there is something fundamentally different here. Any other question, comment? Maybe in the back. That uh, not necessarily is triggered by the environment. Like maybe dormancy is a reaction to the environment. I don't know. And the sleeping. It might be if you th believe it's more efficient at night where we cannot do yeah. a lot of stuff before electricity, let's say, to just uh, save energy to the day when it is more efficient to be active. Maybe that was the environmental signal, just the cycle yeah. of the sun. Yeah. But maybe, you know, also describing how this, uh, the relationship between the dormant's like uh, activity with the environment can help to define better, like, some stuff. The only thing I'll add to that is that, um, and I'll, I'll explain this in a slide, is that there are examples of what we refer to as responsive dormancy, where there are environmental signals that, that regulate transitions, but it doesn't have to be environmentally triggered. So. I, I have another proposition. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe um, the sleep and being awake only works as a whole. You cannot always be awake, so it, you need to see it as as one cycle, as one thing. Uh -huh. Whereas maybe some some animals do not have to uh, hibernate. It can, it can, their life can still work and be okay without this. The cycling. Yeah. Okay. Possibly. Yeah. Yes, sorry, again, as someone who knows nothing about <laughs> this, I think this makes sense because, I mean, I think sleep. <laughs> is something that, like, let's say mammals need physiologically in order to stay alive. But what if I take, like, one mammal that normally hibernates because it lives in an environment where during winter, for example, there's very low supply of food and put it somewhere else where it's constant spring and food is always abundant. Yeah. Would they still, like, yeah. be hibernating with the same frequency or yeah. would yeah. they not? I don't know. Again, as so someone who doesn't know anything. I think with this discussion, the, the interesting thing about sleep, I'm sitting here thinking, is like, well, I don't know a lot about sleep. But I think what it does is it, it's an example of, some, of, a, of, a, of a situation that challenges my definition. And, and, and because I've been thinking about this even more recently, maybe it's something I need to re revisit. For the time being, I'm going to use this generic definition. Uh, and I'm doing this to kind of make some broad sweeping. Um, yeah, it's a framework. And maybe there's some ways in which it needs to be modified. 
And sleep may be one example where uh, we, we've, we found a biological phenomenon that seems to match the definition, but it's not quite something that we would call dormancy. I think that's what I'm taking away from this conversation, which is, which is good. I haven't had this, uh, this sleep discussion in a while uh, in this depth. So, um, so I'll try to describe maybe a little bit more conceptually what, um, what dormancy is, because I think it's really fascinating. There are people who dedicate their whole lives to studying sea dormancy or the production of aphipia and crustaceans and uh, the biochemical molecular ways and the regulation that's involved. And that's really fascinating. Um, but you know, when I, what I find is when I talk with people who work in those very specific fields on a specific group of organisms, is that different languages come up. There's a lot of, we get tripped up in terms of trying to uh, find commonality and generalities because of some of the details. And so um, what I want to try to do is just present a framework. It's a real simple one that will hopefully, uh, I can share some ideas on how we think about uh, dormancy. And of course, no one has to agree, but we could start with uh, the simplest type of population biology model that you can conceivably imagine, right? And so there's a number of individuals uh, that are represented by the, the dimensions or size of the state variable, which is the number of active individuals. So all of these individuals we can imagine are just turned on, and maybe they're even growing at their maximum growth rate. And the population size is going to be balanced by some net reproductive rate and uh, uh, a mortality term, which maybe says some density independent rate of mortality. Okay. So what do we need to do now to to incorporate in the simplest possible way to represent some of the features or fundamentals of dormancy. We need a new, first we need a new state variable, which I'll just define as the number of inactive individuals in a, in a population, okay? And then there have to be a couple new arrows or transitions, processes, if you will, that will determine the changes in those state variables over time. Um, and so, so it was already mentioned, like, so maybe there are environmental triggers to dormancy, and that's true. Uh, individuals will, over evolutionary time, will invest in um, cellular machinery and sensing capabilities to determine uh, changes in their environment. And that can serve as a cue, an environmental trigger, if you will, for transitioning. Um, and sometimes, like, so things like changes in water temperature or photo period or the detection of metabolites in your environment that may be a signal that there's high density or that the, the quality of your environment is deteriorating. All those could be perhaps sensed and used uh, as ways to make uh, informed decisions about transitioning into and out of dormancy. Okay? And resuscitation is just this process of waking up from, from dormancy. Um, so it can be responsive. So this is one category, a class of ways in which we can think about those transitionings occurring in an environmentally deterministic, responsive manner. Um, but sometimes there are environments that change so rapidly, so unpredictably, there's so much noise that investing in the cellular machinery isn't worthwhile. And so what happens in those instances is that you get the evolution of stochastic switching where some proportion of individuals in a, in a way of bet hedging manner will, will transition randomly into these states. And, in, and depending on the optimality of those decisions and the, as defined by the environment and how noisy it is, um, these can confer fitness advantages to populations in terms of their geometric mean fitness over time. And so that's how dormancy evolves in different environments. At least that's the, that's the existing theory. The other arrow that I want to talk about just briefly is the mortality term associated with dormant individuals. It's generally assumed that, that uh, the size of that arrow would be smaller than it would be for active individuals. That's the benefit. You've reduced mortality in environments that would otherwise lead you to die. Um, in practice, uh, there are organisms that can you know, be in a dormant state for days or weeks. Um, but we see other examples, especially in microbial systems, where people are able to revive bacteria from ancient materials that are dated to hundreds of millions of years. So samples from amber, halite crystals, and permafrost samples. And so uh, at a cellular level, because this is what this class, I think, is, is about, uh, what, what determines the, the, the duration in which an organism can spend it? What, what's the time limit? 
Um, and so it's not a cost-free state of existence. You still have to maintain homeostasis. You have to battle entropy, right? Uh, you have to maintain energized membranes. You need to maintain pH. Uh, there are damage that's going to accrue over time, misfolded proteins or uh, genetic damages to DNA that need to be repaired. And if you're completely turned off and you don't have enough endogenous reserves to meet those energetic basal metabolic requirements, then an individual is going to die. But we're going to assume that that mortality rate is much lower than what it would be if the cell were remained in an active state. So the thing that we need to take uh, away from this is that there's, uh, there, there's deterministic and stochastic transitioning. Some, determ some are based on the environment and the rate at which environment changes. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about this, um, this idea of mortality and dormancy and how that affects longevity of microbial cells. So the last iteration of this uh, came about somewhat recently. And um, I don't know if we need to dwell on this too much, but I just want to focus on the information content and the idea that dormancy can give rise to something a term that's used in ecology and evolution called a seed bank. And the seed bank is simply the sum of all uh, metabolically inactive individuals and the, the genetic, phenotypic, and functional diversity that they contain. And in some cases, these seed banks can be quite large. And uh, the, by, by, by considering, and, and so there, there's a lot of, what, what, what is the information contained? If you're thinking about population, it could be different alleles, could be different uh, physiological traits that we've already been discussing. And the ability for those organisms to resuscitate um, serves as a sort of memory for the system. It can affect uh, the dynamics of ecological and evolutionary um, populations and communities. And also migration, which I might talk a little bit about. So to summarize, uh, the way we think about seed banks is that this is an emergent uh, phenomenon that comes from the individual behavior, the transitions of individuals between inactive and inactive states, and the, the, the production or accumulation of those individuals in communities. It operates across uh, both temporal and spatial scales. We can think about the processes that regulate dormancy on scales of minutes, hours, to millennia, and uh, they also affect spatial processes as well. And these operate across uh, biological levels of organization. Uh, we can think about this at cellular levels. We can think about it at the ecosystem scale. Um, it creates structure, this memory, the potential for feedback. So I think about this quite a bit. I don't expect everyone here to really care or, or incorporate this into their research. But I would argue that you know, if you were completely ignorant of this or didn't you know, ignored these, these properties that I, I would argue are common to all types of life, then there might be instances where we might not be able to predict or understand dynamics, the stability of a system, the resiliency, um, as we would if we were thinking about dormancy, or at least aware that it existed and it could be imparting a signature on a system. Um, I've been thinking, what are you supposed to do when you're on sabbatical? Uh, I, I, I'm supposed to think a little bit. and. Um, I just went down to Zurich and gave a talk in this new center on the origins and prevalence of life. And I had been reading a book when I came over here by Stuart Kaufman, who's a physicist who thinks about autocatalytic sets and uh, chemical systems uh, at the origins of life. And I started thinking about uh, whether or not dormancy, how far back dormancy might go. It turns out it's very ancient. And uh, so what I've been doing is I've been reading and trying to find examples in the literature of how far back we can date dormancy in Earth's history. And of course, Earth's history is quite long, and some of these examples are, are very short on that time scale, but um, slime molds have been recovered from uh, amber that have conservation of sporocarps, which are structures that uh, hold dormant spores. Um, the rest of these structures have completely diverged over time, so they don't look anything alike, but there's conservation in these dormancy structures suggesting that there's evolutionary stasis associated with them. Uh, there's this group of organisms that are pre-mammalian tetrapads called synapsids that existed in the early Triassic about 250 million years ago. Uh, they were found on different continents, some in Antarctica, still when it was very cold and harsh and very seasonal environment, and they compared them to synapsid fossils that were found in other places at the same time. 
you could look at their tusks and look at the growth rings. And authors of this paper suggested that these organisms were capable of engaging in a torpor uh, so 250 million years ago due to the harsh conditions of where they lived in Antarctica. Uh, going back to 480 million years ago, we're at a time period where we can start to think about the transition of life in water onto land. And there are algal fossil remains called cryptospores uh, that are thought to be important for that transition of life from water to land. And we can go into the Precambrian as well. So now we're in, 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 in a, uh, at a time when there are only microorganisms. Uh, Aconites are a specialized cell type of cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria themselves are about 3.85 million years old, at least based on microfossil evidence. Uh, but these aconites are specialized cells uh, that can store carbon reserve and aid in the desiccation tolerance and uh, thermal tolerance of these cells. And they've been recovered from shales uh, dating to 2.1 uh, billion years. But all these examples are ancient. I think we can, we can agree on that. But the, the complexity in which organisms have uh, evolved, even at 2.1 billion years ago, there's a lot of genes that are involved in aconite formation. So if we want to invoke something about uh, whether or not dormancy may have been important in early Earth conditions, which are probably inherently dynamic, harsh, and fluctuating, um, are there easier ways at which we could achieve dormancy? So I've been thinking a little bit about um, some simpler forms. So, so some of you may be familiar with like, persister cells. Uh, these are organisms that can tolerate antibiotics and other environmental conditions, not by, through genetic changes, but through, in some cases, things like toxin antitoxin modules, maybe other ways. And in the simplest example there, you only need two genes. So one gene produces a toxin, and another gene produces a molecule that will, either an RNA or protein that will uh, bind that toxin. And as long as those two things are working in concert to one another, this, the cell is going to be active. But if toxin accumulations increase for whatever reason, and the antitoxin doesn't, then the cell is either going to turn off or die. So now we've kind of come down to just even like a simple two-gene-like system where we can achieve something that uh, we would all kind of recognize as being a form of dormancy, or at least I would recognize as a form of dormancy. Um, and there's other people in this room who think about things like stochastic gene expression, right, and how that can regulate not only the expression of a protein, but also the metabolism of a cell. Uh, we can envision a cell where there's a lot of proteins and molecules. Some of them are at low abundance. And there's a probability of one molecule encountering another one and whether or not that's going to create a catalytic reaction. And so um, th those probabilities can be low in some cases. And so you can come up with a distribution of metabolic activity within a population of E. coli growing under LB where there's this long tail distribution of metabolic activity such that some cells are highly active and then there may be lots of cells in that population that are not achieving their maximal growth rate. So if that's true, and if that's universal and unavoidable, then it's possible that maybe um, in, in, you know, 4.5, 4, 4, 4 billion years ago, uh, dormancy would have been some um, property that would be inherent to life that maybe uh, contributed to the persistence of life. At least those are some of the arguments that I'm still working on. And, and they're not, obviously, um, some of it's conjecture. It's hard to make strong inference about things that happened at this time. But, but we're working through those sorts of ideas right now. Um, so, this, so, so this leads to the question, how, how easy is dormancy? And I'll just, this is a little toy example that maybe, maybe you will like or you won't like. Um, but there are these um, cellular automaton models that were created in the 1970s by John Conway, zero player game of life models, right? And so you can think, you can look at this array here on the left, and you can take a local environment, and you can focus in on one cell. And each cell can have one of two states. It's either going to be on or it's going to be off, right? Live or dead. And then this uh, deterministic game is going to be updated each time step, and you're going to get a new confirmation based on these simple rules. Um, it's a little bit shaded, so I'll, I'll go through them. Um, if you focus on. this individual in the center. Let's just focus on that. Um, this is currently a live cell. If it has less than two individuals, in the next time step, it's going to turn white. It's going to be dead. OK, and that's, we can imagine in a biological sense that this is due to underpopulation or maybe some allele, allele effect, right? 
So, so if you don't have enough individuals, you can't reproduce. If a, a live cell in the middle has two or three living neighbors, which is represented here, then in the next time step, it will remain alive. If the live cell here had three or more neighbors, it would die due to overpopulation. And a dead cell here, if it had three neighbors, which is not represented in this situation, then it would become alive in the next step because conditions were good and populations were, were growing. Okay, so that, those are the simple rules. This is the vanilla game of life model. Um, so I was working with a, a student named Pat Wall, who's an informatician, and we, had, we found this paper. It was published in a, a book in 2006, which kind of introduced this idea. And it was, could, could you create dormant life um, in this type of cellular automaton model? And the first thing you would need to do now, again, is create a new kind of state. So you have um, white is still dead, orange in this case is alive, and brown is going to be a, something that reflects dormancy in some way, a dormant individual. And to, to represent that, we've just changed the model, the, the rules a little bit. So uh, a live cell with uh, zero living neighbors is still going to die. A live cell with one living neighbor is going to go dormant. A live cell with two to three living neighbors will be alive in the next time step. A live cell with more than li three living cells is going to, going to die. And a dormant cell with two to three living neighbors would resuscitate. So we know that there are certain things like chemical cues that are secreted by active individuals that can wake up uh, dormant cells. So uh, I'll just show this simulation over time and let you look at the behavior and dynamics. You can see that without dormancy, uh, the population size, the, the number of active cells declines pretty rapidly by 100 time steps. Uh, these objects over here look like nothing's going on, but they're actually updating. These are called still life features that are common in the game of life. But with this additional state variable and this small modification of rules, we get the persistence of life over time. Is this a function of your initial configuration, or is this something that is universal across no matter what the situation? So this is uh, just one simulation with one set of starting conditions, but we've um, done other simulations where we've explored lots of different starting conditions. And we've mapped out the whole configuration space, actually. Um, and what it seems like is that there's a lot of ways in which a lot of starting conditions that lead to dormancy, or lead to extinction uh, without, without dormancy encoded. Yeah. Just a curiosity, does the model with the dormancy also have these still life features, or is this something that is lost once you introduce this new state? Uh, we haven't gone through and visualized, and I don't know if there's an easy way to kind of computationally like document whether or not there are still life dynamics. Um, but, if you, but you could probably easily go through a series of these. Depending on the size of, so to do this kind of even somewhat more quantitatively, we have to reduce the size of these neighborhoods by a lot. Um, but that would be kind of interesting. Maybe there is some way to kind of identify whether or not there are certain features or objects or domains, if you will, um, that are more common with or without this representation of dormancy. Yeah. Jake, uh, I have a question about the game of life. So this is a universal Turing machine. Depending on the initial conditions, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. So I guess in this case, you try different initial conditions. This is basically equal to program the computer. Yeah. So according to the initial input is the result that you have. So I guess that this is just a special case. This is just one example just to illustrate. Yeah, so this uh, the student I've been working with, um, recently moved to New York City and is working on some other things. And so um, I thought I would uh, pitch this idea. It's half formed. We have other, um, lots more simulations that kind of describe the behaviors of all the possible initial starting conditions, but for a much smaller uh, array of initial, uh, of size of, of a population. So my guess is that if you try it at random, you are going to have everything, uh, basically. Uh, you In mean random line, initial conditions? The blue line. Uh, with random initial conditions? Yeah, so depending yeah. on the size of the grid, of course. Yeah. Uh, what I can say is that when we've, we've carved out a smaller grid for computational and, and practical purposes, 
And I mean, there are distributions of, of potential outputs depending on starting conditions. But we do see really big differences, for example, in the fraction of living cells if we include this state in these rules. Yeah, so, so there, there are differences. Yeah, they seem to be fairly consistent. Sorry, um, two, two part questions, maybe along the same lines. Um, I guess your rules of life, right, sort of how many neighbors you need to switch off and on yeah. depends your fraction pretty much directly, right? The number of rules? The, the sort of the size of rules, how many of neighbors you need, yeah. need to live, that sort yeah. of nicely defines your fraction of living cells. Yeah, so I think one of the things that, is that a question or is yeah, that? So, no, that is a question. OK. Um, or am I missing? <laughs> one of the things we've been thinking about is what, what if you change these rules? Because they're, they're somewhat, they're not totally arbitrary. But uh, the other thing that I've been more concerned about is whether or not these results could be affected by the fact that you have two states versus three states. And that, that, that light brown it may not be a function of, of dormancy per se. It just be, may be a function of you having three things versus two things. And that's been trickier for me to kind of uh, wrestle with intellectually and philosophically. Like, by definition, you have to have another state, a metabolic state in these models. But if you had some other <laughs> rules that were sort of divorced from the concept of dormancy, would you still see more persistence and stability just because you have three states as opposed to two states, if that makes sense? If you don't have a state, maybe you can have migration. So that would probably give you persistence of life. So I don't, I, I don't know anything about this. But uh, I guess that when you do cellular autom automata model, you can basically add individuals by having uh, a cons an influx with migration. Yeah. And you probably can see the persistence of life as well yeah. without the third state. But I, it's a guess. No, but I, I think, like, um, I mean, that's an important, like, takeaway, I think, at some point, is that in some cases, dispersal in time and dispersal in space are substitutable and can give, can be interchangeable. I think there are instances when it's been shown mathematically that that's not the case. Um, but ecologists have tend to think about these things as being orthogonal, that, that dispersal in space, movement of individuals across space, um, is somehow different than uh, dispersal in time. Yeah, I, b I bet you're right. I bet you if, you if you could create a model, and probably somebody has, where you could have migration from another patch. So the point here is, is, um, is basically is building off this idea of how easy is dormancy. How, I mean, with the examples that I've described and some of the ones that I'm going to move on to with certain groups of bacteria are really complex. But I've just been curious about whether or not there are simple, easy ways to achieve this definition of, of dormancy. And, and how might we do this um, in the easiest possible way? OK. Um, so let's talk a little bit about microbes, because we haven't really been talking about them. Uh, so dormancy is not something that's probably new to most microbiologists. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on uh, the role of dormancy in human health and pathogens. Uh, on the left, I'm showing a picture here that's supposed to kind of um, depict uh, Vibrio cholera, uh, which is uh, uh, found in coastal waterways. Uh, it can enter something called a viable but not culturable phase, which is uh, really dependent on temperature and, and, and basically limits the geographical range of where we find uh, Vibrio cholera. Um, in North America, I'm not sure about in Europe, we have these uh, deer ticks um, called ixodes. And they, they have a, a spirochete in them that if it infects you, you get Lyme disease. Um, I see people from Illinois shaking their head. Right? I think it's malmoved, mostly in the northeastern United States for the past two decades, but now expanding westward. Um, and you get this bullseye rash or lesion on your arms, and you go to the doctor, and they immediately give you, I think, amoxicillin, right? And, and that, that rash goes away, and you don't have to suffer flu-like symptoms for a while. But there are reports that 10 years after having Lyme disease and no subsequent known exposure that some individuals will start to have symptoms. And there's been speculation that maybe some of these spirochetes, which are known to be slow-growing microorganisms, can kind of lay low below the host immune system. and then reemerge later. Um, the last example is that of uh, uh, 
mycobacterium, tuberculosis, the causative agent of TB. Uh, it kills about two million people a year, and one third of the world's population is just walking around with what are called latent infections. And so in all these examples, or at least some of them, we know a lot about the molecular mechanisms that determine transition and allow for persistence uh, during dormant states. Um, but when we first started getting into this, this idea, this framework, I would say not so much was known about um, the prevalence of, of dormancy or seed banks in the wild or in natural systems. Um, so the first thing, this is some work I did with a former postdoc, Stuart Jones. Um, this is sort of my default. Before we start lifting a pipette or doing anything, I just kind of want to see what's going on in the literature first and try to get as much data as I can in the easiest way, shortest way possible. So we looked in the literature for people who had tried to come up with single cell approaches to quantifying the fraction of active and inactive cells. And you can do this in a couple of different ways. So, um, you know, in the 1990, late 1990s, early 2000s, people were still doing a lot of fluorescent in situ hybridization using uh, uh, probes that would bind to ribosome, 16S ribosomal RNA, and so you could look at the total number of cells and the number of cells that had a positive report based on the number of ribosomes, which are used for protein and translation, right? So that's one way. Uh, there, are, there are metabolic stains that people use for looking at electron transport chain and ATP, uh, which can be quantified either microscopically or through flow cytometry. And so these are the results we gather from the literature. What can you hope for, right? Uh, what's sort of interesting is that among the data that we collected, there's not a whole lot of variation within a given ecosystem, but there's a lot of variation across ecosystems. Um, so the human gut and wastewater treatment plants, based on the data that we had available to us, somewhere like 25 to 30 percent of all those individuals are metabolically inactive. Uh, but in soils, in soils, uh, we, we had some foreshadowing to this problem, uh, we see that upwards of 90 percent of all those individuals that are important for what? Um, uh, retaining organic carbon, large reservoir of organic carbon that we don't want to go in the atmosphere, uh, storage of carbon, recycling of nutrients, production and consumption of trace gases to the atmosphere, lots of important functions for uh, the fertility and production of food systems. 90% of all of those microorganisms at any given point in time appear to be metabolically inactive. Any thoughts on why we might see differences among ecosystems and the proportion of active cells? I still don't really understand how you can measure this. I mean, inactive cells, inactive cells also have ribosomes. They just have a bit fewer yeah, ribosomes. It I becomes mean, a detection issue, right? Like you're going to, if you, sure, so, so if you, you have a cell and maybe it has three ribosomes in it or 10 ribosomes in it. So if you do an no, assay. No, but we're talking about you go from 100,000 to 10,000. That, that's sort of okay. the numbers we're talking about. Yeah. So you don't think there are any cells that have fewer than 10,000 ribosomes in them? Well, there are probably small cells. I'm just, I'm just giving you numbers for E. coli, right? I don't, I don't know how it is. I mean, this is also going to vary by species. This is species. definitely not E. coli, right? No, no, but it's yeah. going to vary by species. It's like in the soil, you might sure. be subtle or whatever, right? It's not so different. Yeah. So this is not a, a model system in the laboratory. These are samples that were obtained from, from the natural environment. I have a similar question, kind of going in the same direction. Um, for different ecosystems, would you ex also, or for these different um, niches, would you also expect to have experimental biases in them yeah. um, during the measurements? Could you comment on that? Yeah, so we, we, we went to the literature, and people do all of these methods, uh, approaches. And this is sort of a, what we would call maybe a, a pseudo-meta-analysis, where you're going to the literature and just finding whatever data that exists, it meets some criteria. It had to fit one of those methods where there were single cell assays um, that either used a, a metabolic stain or were using fluorescent in situ hybridization targeting uh, ribosomes and ribosome activity. And so every person probably does things in a slightly different way, the incubation times, the conditions under which they're doing it, how samples are processed. Lots of, so we would assume that like Probably all of these, the, these, these approaches were done in slightly different ways. 
yet we see this, this general pattern. And we didn't try to make any, we didn't try to test any hypotheses, I should say, with this. This was just purely discovery and exploration. We knew that people were using some, at this point, 2010, there had been no systematic work done across ecosystem to try to, to evaluate the, the extent to which cell, on a cell, individual cell level, the proportion of active cells in samples. So um, we had no, no, no expectations going in. Um, I don't even think it's really that interesting of a figure other than it just says that there's variation. Yeah. So if, if you would expect to, because I have no idea about these measurements, but if you maybe would actually introduce a bias just depending on um, kind yeah. of which kind of system you're measuring in. I don't know if detection yeah. varies, et cetera. So you might imagine that some of those techniques might be particularly hard in soils because cells are attached to minerals and organic material and there has to be an extraction process and that visualizing cells, uh, given the matrix in which they were extracted, could be difficult. Might be the same is true with, um, you know, a, a wastewater treatment plant. Some of these techniques have been developed, at least in environmental microbiology and oceans and freshwater ecosystems, so I would tend to trust those approaches in those environments more so. Uh, what I can say is, you know, the only number that seems to be um, sort of remarkable is, is soils, and there are different ways to kind of get at that same information by extracting things like other biomolecules from soils, uh, measuring respiration rates, uh, using fumigation techniques, et cetera. And um, there, there, is a, there is support before and after this paper suggesting that um, there's a lot, of bi a lot of microbial biomass in soil samples that's not contributing to the activity that's measured at any given point in time. I'll, I'll just make a wild random guess here why souls could be <laughs> more dormant. Um, from my limited understanding is that sort of because soil is a very porous structure, you have these very small niches of nutrients and eventually they decline a lot faster. Whereas in an ocean, freshwater, water, wastewater, they tend to just get new nutrients all the time. Yeah. But porous structures have this inexplicable ability to just not get new nutrients ever. Mm -hmm. That's my, I don't know, yeah. that, that would be my guess. Um, but my question is more, what is inactive here? Is dormancy, when I think of a microbe, you go into stationary, is that already a dormancy? Because it sort of expands your lifetime, you know, sort of orders of magnitude sometimes mm -hmm. above your like max metabolism. Mm -hmm. Save the, like, the E. coli that grows in 20 minutes, but it can also live a week in that. Is it a dormant state or is it not? So it has reduced metabolic activity, right? I think so, yes. Okay. <laughs> and then when uh, conditions change, it can resume its activity? Yes. I'd be okay with that. I mean, we can argue about definitions. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's productive. Uh, to, to do that, but um, I mean, I think it, it captures some aspect of a microorganism's ability to go some period of time under conditions that are not suitable for growth and reproduction. And then when conditions change, it can resume growth. And personally, I'm, I'm at, the, at the scope and the, the, the level that I'm trying to talk, I would say that that probably satisfies some definition of dormant. We can create another category of thing, if we want to call it that. But I would argue that it, it should be, uh, it should have an equally good definition for that <laughs> to make it distinct, right? So this is like uh, a colleague of mine is just like, wow, it's like lumping things. Like when do we lump and when do we split? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm lumping it too high of a level. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so for, the, for getting these numbers, operationally, what's the, what's the difference between a dormant cell and a dead cell? A dormant cell is one that one can wake up in the, in the lab with, known, with a known change of... Um, so in this case, we don't know whether or not, so I, the, the y-axis is, is, is labeled as inactive cells. So we can look at cells using one of those um, analytical methods and we can, somebody else scored that cell as either having, uh, with a given threshold and sensitivity, it was either exhibited activity or did not exhibit activity. Mm. So inactive can mean dead also in this, inactive in in this, this case, case. Inactive in this case could be dead. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. 
And, 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 and molecularly, we have explored that distinction as well. So we, we, we do some environmental metagenomics, and we've processed samples where we can treat samples with uh, things like, uh, well, there, there are kits called propidium iodine kits that can look for compromised membranes, or you can treat samples with uh, DNAs, which will degrade uh, all extracellular DNA that would otherwise be amplified. Um, so there's probably some contribution to dead cells. In other studies that we've done, it's, uh, it's relatively small, like 5 to 10 percent. But that would still, those, those numbers would be included here. Yeah. Um, since you have these changes and you have this prevalence of um, dormancy in soils, does dormancy correlate with any other relevant trait that can add information to this picture? So, so, yeah, so the question is, is does dormancy correlate with other, uh, yeah, so, uh, I mean, this is sort of uh, not a PC term used anymore, but in the 1970s, when people first started thinking about dormancy in the oceans, they referred to them as dwarf cells because they're small. Um, so, so people were, uh, I'm not sure exactly what techniques, looking, looking under the microscope, and people found that cells that are starved for, for nutrients and energy or stress in other ways tend to, on average, get smaller. So that would be a trait that would be correlated at some level in some ecosystems with. But not when they are alive, though. Oh, you're saying the distinguishing be between live and yeah, dead? Yeah, because yeah. even in stationary phase, indeed, they, so they become smaller. Yeah. So I was wondering if there is any correlation with traits that you can measure when, in principle, they are ah. not dormant. Um, yeah, so the only trait I know for distinguishing, like if you saw a cellular structure mm -hmm. and you thought, well, it, that could either be dormant or dead, the thing that I think a lot of people will, in practice, use are looking for signatures of a compromised membrane. So if you have a hole in a membrane, then that's likely not to be repaired, uh, and that cell would be dead. I mean, there might be other kind of, in principle, theoretical ways that you could know when a cell is alive versus dead based on, for example, ATP charge on a membrane or something like that. But in an environmental sample, like some of the ones that we're talking about, I think that might, that might be. Right. So actually, sorry. Yeah. Dormancy is present uh, in cells that are usually, I don't know, fast growers. I'm making it up. But just uh, a trait that you can measure across species, uh, mm -hmm. and you can say, OK, this per this, uh, you see dormancy in this branch of the phylogenetic tree. Yeah. What other traits do you see in that branch of the phylogenetic tree that I are see. not? Um, that was, but maybe it's a, it, it, we can discuss. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware, but I do think that um, one of the things you said is, is true is that there's, there's, there's definitely different ways in which organisms can achieve this. They do it in very different ways. Some are well characterized, and in some, for some lineages, we don't know if, if those organisms have active me measures. Like, so when I talk to some colleagues of mine who are mathematicians, they talk about, the, they use this language of like falling into dormancy. And it's like this passive process that I'm envisioning. The cell is just like falling backwards. <laughs> it just can no longer stand up. It's so tired. Um, but that's not true for, for at least some microorganisms. So, um, yeah, so that's an interesting idea, like whether or not there are other characteristics that might help guide um, an investigation like this. OK, we have a question from Sergei. And then yeah. another there. Hi, Jay. <clears throat> it's an interesting um, plot, and uh, I wonder if you try to quantify it in terms of the, because the one attractive hypothesis is that the dormancy is uh, influenced by the frequency of environmental fluctuations, like nutrient supply disruptions and yeah. things like this. So one may argue that guts and uh, wastewater treatment plants are relatively stable environments. Guts, you know, of a live organism gets nutrients several times a day. Um, and on the other hand, the uh, soil is probably fairly unpredictable. So kind of a constructive way to try to probe it is uh, to look closer at the oceans. And in the ocean, the theory is that uh, the more temperate oceans are less fluctuating and more yeah. temperate ones are more. Yeah. Is there any systematic change in dormancy across uh, latitude in the ocean? 
I'm not aware of any systematic study, but I think that's an interesting. So could you, in a comparative sense, uh, look for these, these traits and the activity of cells in more stable or less stable or fluctuating environments? Uh, the one, I, I did think about that a long time ago. I was doing some work in soils, and you know, the, the, the question came, is like, well, what is it the environment that the cells are experiencing? What, what is fluctuating for a cell at the scale of a micron versus you know, the scale of a, of a gyre, right? <laughs> or a, a body of water in the ocean? But, but yeah, I think, I think you, one could do that. Another hypothesis, of course, is phages. So nobody mentioned phages yet, so I will be the first one. If you are dormant and not dividing, you are kind of invisible to phages. Uh, right. Could it be a strategy to hide from, uh, from a phage uh, infestation? Yeah. Um, we, we published some work on this recently, and I think I'm gonna, I'll talk about that tomorrow in the context of spore-forming bacteria. Um, not to give too much away, but I mean, you have phenotypic switching of a cell, and when it becomes a dormant cell, in the case of an endospore, it's not expressing receptors that allow uh, phage particles to intact. And so this is a form of uh, physiological defense or, or tolerance against phage particles. It, uh, it affects the coevolution of, of those uh, interacting populations. Okay, there was one question from the back, and then I suggest to move. Uh forward, because we are, of course, late. Uh, well, yeah, partially, Sergey already stole my question. But uh, nevertheless, I was thinking that maybe it could be like inversely proportional to some kind of organic carbon influx, because uh, yeah. in God's wastewater treatment plants, you basically will have a steady influx yeah. of organic carbon. Yeah. In oceans, in fresh water, you will have phototrophs that will produce this organic carbon. And in soil, you've basically just got root exudates. So it's the least uh, peak. Uh, influx of organic carbon that I'm speculating. Basically, the plant would photosynthesize and exudate organic yeah. carbon into the soil. So it could be like uh, that in this case, microbial dormancy is basically a consequence to the absence of organic carbon. Yeah. So How I would think, you comment that? Yeah, I think the, the two, there's two ideas that came up that this figure, with all of its caveats, led us to kind of pursue. One would be uh, I think, as you're suggesting, is the productivity or energy inputs to a system should regulate the metabolic activity of, of cells. And the other one, uh, we can think about soils, and, and this was brought up uh, over here as well, is that there's something about the porosity or physical structure that influences the turnover and the, the, uh, and the input rate of new resources and the turnover of cellular biomass within um, a given uh, environment. And so I think... Um, this is the thing I hesitated to include, but I was thinking about, uh, I could start with the premise that um, cellular life is, is at the mercy of, of currents and, and flows. So this is an assumption. Um, and a chemostat would be a perfect example. Uh, and the theory for a chemostat has been around for, for at least uh, 40 years, I would say, formally. Lots of different models for understanding. As we adjust the dilution rate of a cell and there's a constant input and output, then cells should um, achieve equilibrium, and the dilution rate would be equal to its growth rate. So that theory is pretty well worked out uh, for single uh, populations uh, effectively. There are some ecologists who in the 80s started to develop competition theory based around chemostats for, for growth limiting resources at different dilution rates. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, there hadn't been a systematic development of, of any kind of theory or framework for understanding how variation in flow rates would influence um, the abundance, the productivity, uh, the diversity, or uh, the types of traits that you would expect to see under a given set of conditions and flow rates, which are going to be proportional to things like migration and the rate at which you're encountering new resource particles in the environment, which is the little uh, simulation that we see, two-dimensional simulation on the left. Um, so with a former postdoc, uh, Ken Losey and I, we worked on building some individual-based models, stochastic individual-based models, where we, uh, we, we seeded microbes or microbe-like entities into these uh, flowing environments where traits were uh, drawn randomly from uniform distributions. And we saw uh, a whole bunch of, uh, of different uh, patterns of abundance, productivity, and diversity that um, 
emerged from those simulations, one of which is the percent of dormant cells increasing in reactors of different volume sizes, uh, coded by the different colors. Um, so right now, I have a, a PhD student, Emmy Mueller, who is testing some of those ideas uh, in, in an array of chemostats where she's used um, bacterial communities from a lake, and she introduces them into these reactors uh, that are um, use, where, where filtered lake water is used as a medium, and we just dial up the residence time, in this case across six orders of magnitude, and you can see that there are fundamental things like abundance changes, there are changes in productivity at the aggregate level and also at the single cell level, and uh, patterns and changes in the composition and richness of communities as a function of residence time. So, so richness means time is a process of division, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the average amount of time that um, a molecule uh, or a unit of water stays in the system. So, um, so I, I didn't intend to go into this in real deep, but I was trying to think, you know, where have we come with some of these ideas and uh, what came out of that figure? And one of them was thinking about how, um, yes, productivity and energy inputs could matter, but it also there's something about the physical turnover of the matrix in which microorganisms live that might lead to. So think about the human gut, right? We have lots of bacteria in our gut. Um, is it a good decision for organisms if the residence time of an insect gut is on the, on the order of like hours or minutes, is it a good idea for that organism to engage in dormancy because it will be washed out of the system at some point? So, the, so only active individuals which can replicate on the time scale of the, the, the residence time of the system in which it inhabits will be able to persist in that system. Otherwise, they're gonna succumb to wash out. And at extremely high residence times, the input rates of, of migrations and resources are gonna be so low that dormancy may be the only way in which an organism can persist. Um, going back to our original model, we talked about that error. So, Jacob, how, how we, should I, I could. Okay. Maybe this is okay. Maybe this is okay place to stop then. Okay. I don't know. Um, there's other little vignettes, but um, we, we, we went from, it's, it's quarter after 10 now? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I, could, I can pick up, so I'm gonna talk tomorrow and address this uh, issue that Sergey asked, which is, um, maybe I'll just give, use a couple minutes to give you a preview for tomorrow, if that makes sense. Uh, I'll skip ahead. I think maybe Will Shoemaker uh, was already, he's been here in the course, he's not here today, but um, we did, worked on some projects where we tried to figure out the duration of time, how long can microbes stay dormant, because this puts some limits on uh, the extent of dormancy and the size of the seed bank. Uh, we're thinking a lot about endospore-forming bacteria as a, as a way, a model system for studying dormancy. It opens up a lot of opportunities for uh, manipulation. It's an ancient, complex trait. It's really time-consuming uh, to engage in. Um, and we've been thinking about what is the cost of making a spore. It's a bit of a conundrum that this cell um, should do what it does because uh, there's this idea of falling into dormancy, which might not take very much input. You're starving. You don't have the essential resources for maintaining your cell or reproducing. Um, falling into dormancy seems like that would be a great, a great option. But some uh, bacteria like endospore forming bacillus and clostridia, which are abundant and cosmopolitanly distributed, seem to have major chunks of their genome on the order of 5 to 10 percent, 500 genes, that are needed to make a, a productive endospore. And it takes a long time to do it. So we've been thinking about, um, well, what does it actually cost to make uh, an endospore? And we've been using genomic, transcriptomic, and proteomic data uh, to get at estimates of the replication, uh, transcriptional and translational cost associated with all of those 500 genes during the developmental production of an endospore. Um, and it seems like it's quite, uh, expensive. If we relativize this to the total cost of what it makes for cell, uh, what it means for cell division, the sum of sporulation and germination costs are somewhere around 35 to 40 percent of the total cell budget. Uh, more than essential more proteins, more than a whole bunch of other uh, processes that are involved in the stress response of bacillus, competency, motility, and basal metabolism. Um, so it's, it seems to be really cost, uh, 
very costly. There's risk involved in how cells commit to this. And what it leads me to ask, and I'll leave it on this note, is are there other, um, are there other processes? I'll leave you with this question. Um, something that seems to be expensive, something that seems to be risky, yet common and been around for a long time, how is it maintained? And in fact, it can be lost. Uh, we've done this in our experiments with Will. Other people have done this. If you passage a spore-forming bacteria under good conditions for weeks, mutations will, will hit one of those genes, one of those targets in the genome that's required for making an endospore. So a trait that's been around for a good chunk of three billion years on Earth can be lost in a month. And if you look throughout the, 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 the phylum of the Firmicutes, or now the Basilota, you can see that this trait has been lost repeatedly through time. But there are two major lineages, the Clostridiales and the Bacillus, that seem to be able to retain this trait. What is it that, uh, is it just harsh environmental conditions? Or are there other things that are going on in nature, in the world, that could potentially reinforce the, 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 the maintenance of this particular ancient trait? One we've already heard proposed is, is phage. Uh, it could also be predation, right? So if there's any kind of size, if there's any selectivity of a predator or a parasite, uh, that would potentially add a little bit of extra bonus to dormancy. And then the other thing um, that, I, that I won't get to, but I want to make a point of, is that uh, the movement of individuals in space, dispersal, migration, if you will, can be assisted and can be positively correlated with uh, with dormancy. Individuals that are moving from one environment to the next, there's risk associated with that for passively moving individuals. There's risk of, of dying in transit. And there's a risk of landing in a new patch that's not optimal for growth and reproduction when you arrive. And if you have the ability to be dormant in transit or when you arrive, this would provide an opportunity to wait until conditions can change where you can subsequently invade and colonize a new patch. Um, so these are some of the, uh, the two ways in which I'm thinking uh, that, that are non-traditional, at least in mainstream ecology, where we may find uh, that dormancy can be reinforced uh, when otherwise it might appear at the surface that this trait could be costly and maybe not adaptive. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it on that. And then, and then tomorrow we'll, we'll talk a little bit more detail about some um, phage bacteria interactions and coevolution. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So, uh, gravity. So, we had uh, so many questions. Yeah, still works, surprisingly. Uh, I suggest that if there is one pressing question, uh, Jay can answer it, and in the meanwhile, we transition to the next presentation. No pressing question. Okay. Very good. So, let's thank.